from Saturday <laughs> night to Sunday night, a new book that I cannot wait to crack. My 40 years of laughter, tears, and touchdowns in television. And again, I will share uh, with you um, how incredibly open he is to people who reach out to him for advice. I'm one of them. This show might not exist without his counsel. <laughs> Me trying to carve this out of a contract with the NFL years ago. Um, he was a consigliere, for the lack of a better phrase, for me. Um, but also so many pop culture moments, sports and entertainment that we've enjoyed over the last half century, courtesy of this man's grit, determination, and, of course, vision from Saturday night to Sunday night, where all books are sold right now. Uh, joining me on the Mercedes-Benz Vans phone line on the Rich Eisen Show, Dick Ebersole. How are you, sir? Thank you very much. Do I get a Mercedes? <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> yes, you do, by the way. You know, what's the, what, what color interior do you want, Dick? We can figure. We can work on that. We can figure that. A dark, dark can. Okay. Very good. What, actually, I think that's called Tahoe. I think that's called the Tahoe color. I don't know. We just very, nice. very nice. How are you doing? Good to chat with you. Great. I'm at Notre Dame with Willie and my wife, Susan, uh, speaking to a, a couple of groups today. Okay. Uh, just enjoying life and having no, no pressure, just uh, seeing friends. What do you think of when you're seeing uh, Thursday Night Football streaming on Amazon, Dick? What are your two cents on that subject matter, that we just watched a, a Thursday night football game, a package that uh, was born out of uh, a lot of hands being put on it, including NBC Sports from back in the day. What do, you, what do you think about the world we're living in right now, Dick Ebersole? Well, for starters, the greatest football television producer who's ever walked the face of the earth is Fred Gadelli. Mm-hmm. He did years and years of Sunday night football for me, making it the number one show on television. And Amazon was very smart in the deal that they made with the NFL and NBC to uh, require that they get Gadelli. And uh, so that game last night was extra special because Fred Gadelli was doing it. And Al was calling it. You know, and Al was calling it. And Al likes Fred's dulcet tones in his ear. Yeah, of course, he does. <laughs> um, how difficult was it to pull off the Oswald the Rabbit for Al Michaels trade years ago at Super Bowl Forty to help birth the Madden Michaels booth for NBC and Sunday Night Football, Dick? Well, I was pretty far down the line already with uh, John, and John's agent Sandy Montag is a master and. I never had any doubt I was going to be able to get him. Is that so? Yeah. Okay. I didn't. I mean, John really had said for seven or eight years at that point that the one thing he wanted to do was do football for me, and I just wanted to do football with him. It was a match made in heaven, and we had a ball doing it together. Collinsworth told me that he was auditioning, or you had him, um, you know, warming up, if you will, in the pen if Al wasn't being uh if you if al wasn't coming and that you you came you went to him and said i think i can get al but you you tell me if this is really what you want to do and call play by play with madden and his response was if you can get al that's the end of this conversation is that true for sure <laughs> he wanted out he didn't want to do it he was only <laughs> going to do play by play because i wanted him to do play by play um i think of chris like a son and um uh, he was ready to do it, but fortunately enough, John uh, and Sandy got him out of his ESPN deal. Dick Ebersole here on the Rich Eisen Show. Okay, so what made you want to sit down and, and finally put uh, in a book your career, Dick Ebersole? My career, and, and maybe more interestingly enough, how blessed I've been to have the life that I've had. Susie and Charlie, my oldest son, took me to lunch in New York about, I guess, three years ago and said, enough already. You've, you've sort of gone back and forth. You're going to write it. You're not going to write it. You've written a couple of chapters. You've got to do it. You've got to get somebody who you're really comfortable with to write it with you. And I looked at Charlie. I said, who? And he said, Aaron Cohen. And Aaron Cohen is a, a unbelievably talented young writer who had written Olympic openings, for example, for me for years, the ones that Bob would do welcoming you to the nightly telecast and telling you the story uh, of the stories that were about to unfold. And uh, Aaron has been 
unbelievable with me, with the book, and he's still heavily involved uh, for NBC in a number of ventures, and he still works indirectly for ESPN because of his association with Connor Show. So who was the, I think I know the answer to it, but I'll put it out on the, on, on the table for you to answer, the most influential person to help you get started in your career, Dick Ebersol. Uh, fortunately for me, Rune Arledge, who was the most important uh, sports television producer who ever walked the face of the earth. He's the one who pushed, pushed all of his young people, of which I was one, to be storytellers, never to have a telecast where you weren't prepared from the time you came on the air to set the stories of the people who were about to uh, uh, participate in the event that was uh, almost ready to unfold as uh, we came on the air. And what was your biggest break, Dick? Biggest break? Yes, sir. Uh, I would this break was um, as a foreign exchange student living in Normandy, uh, the family I lived with, uh, I convinced them they weren't race car fans, but I said I'd like to see the 24 hours at Le Mans. Uh, they, the father of the household and his three sons, and I drove to Le Mans. And uh, I think I was about 17 at the time. But I went off on my own. All I wanted to do was find the wide world of sports people. I did. I became a gopher, go for coffee, go for ice cream, go for cigarettes, you name it. And by the time that long weekend at Le Mans was over, they said to me, when you're back in the States, come into New York, meet Rune. But most importantly, uh, we'll fix you up with some of the producers there. And for various events, you can be a gopher. And gopher expanded usually beyond going for cigarettes, coffee, and ice cream to uh, being the guy who uh, advanced many of the things that were about to unfold. And more importantly, uh, lined up interviews for the announcers with the major athletes if they were foreign language arranging translation and it was all great and plus i spoke french that's why i was there as a foreign exchange student mm. and um and so the olympics are, were your first gigs is that is that the first big gigs for you they were and when i came back to the states i was finishing up at yale i had a year left and every weekend i uh would uh, get in a car a rent a car drive to Kennedy, most times to Kennedy, and fly to Europe and hook up, usually with an event that Jim McKay was the uh, mm. lead announcer on. And Jim is the father of storytelling in American sport. He was already a great newspaper storyteller, but uh, I became the guy who would uh, give him the my, my bios, and he taught me over a period of a, a year how to really know how to edit a story, how to, uh, particularly for an announcer, to edit it in the fewest number of words so that that announcer would have to absorb it into his mind. It wouldn't sound like he was reading something. So how did you go, Dick Ebersole here on the Rich Eisen Show from Saturday night to Sunday night where all books can be acquired. How did you go from ABC Sports to on the radar screen to create, co-create with Lorne Michaels Saturday Night Live? How did that happen, Dick? Um Herb Schlosser ran NBC for a number of years, and he tried at one point to get me to be interested in being the head of NBC Sports. I was still a kid, and I was wise enough to know I couldn't compete against Arledge. First of all, I might know a little bit about producing, but I knew nothing about negotiating. And you can't be a success in television sports until you know how to acquire the event rights. If you don't have the rights, it doesn't matter how good you think you are or how good you are. You have to have the rights to the event to be there, to be able to cover it, and to be able to produce it. And so how did you wind up uh, with SNL? How did that get born well, for you? Schlosser, uh, having headed me into that uh, NBC sort of uh, attempt to get me to do uh, sports, um, it led him to inquire whether or not I'd be interested in running NBC Sports, as I said, and I really wasn't interested in doing that. Mm -hmm. But one day he threw in, would you like to create a new show, late night show, that would air on Saturday nights? And uh, after about a week of thinking about it, I, I accepted it, dropped out of Yale. My parents were out west on the first long... Uh, this after... <clears throat> Pardon me? Oh, Johnny didn't want his reruns on Saturday night anymore, and that's why that time period was opening up. Really <sighs> reminds me 
And uh, I uh, began uh, almost right away. I'm sorry, I've lost my place. No, no problem. No, no. What happened with Saturday Night Live? So Johnny didn't want. He, Johnny's like, I don't want my rears on Saturday night. That time slot opens up, and you get offered right, the gig. He was trying to get down from five nights a week of doing his show to four nights a week of doing his show, and uh, so it was sort of a free ball for me to find something. I roamed around comedy clubs in the United States and Canada, looking at young comedy talent. wasn't really getting anywhere. And one day, I was at a famous. Hollywood manager's office and out of a door came this young man and he came over and introduced himself. He was Lorne Michaels and uh, he invited me to go to dinner or first of all, to see a comedy club in LA with him. We had dinner when dinner was over serendipity struck again. We went to the polo lunch of the Beverly Hills hotel. Mm -hmm. I lived in the Beverly Hills hotel in those days because I had my deal with NBC guaranteed me a room there. And, uh, Lauren, as we walked in the door, said, isn't that your father figure over there? And I looked with my bad vision, and sure enough, Rune was sitting there with his wife, Howard Cosell, and his wife. I walked over. Rune stood up with open arms. I walked over. He enveloped me in a huge hug, as did Howard, which was very rare. Howard was not a big hug. And uh, I sat with them for a while. I realized that Rune held no hard feelings of the, uh, of the fact that I'd left. And uh, I just felt real comfortable from that point on and uh, about where I was with my life and what I wanted to do. And uh, off I went, uh, continuing to look for people with Lorne. And we found uh, some other production people. Chevy originally we found as a writer, not as a performer, but he kept pushing Lorne that he had great ideas about stuff he could do on the show, which led to one incredible night. We were a couple months, a month later. And we were coming out of a comedy club way downtown in New York. It was a driving rainstorm, Rich. Mm -hmm. And uh, Chevy had been pushing, pushing Lorne and me for this thing, the fall of the week he wanted to do. And I thought it was nuts. Lorne was willing to try it. When all of a sudden Chevy took off in this driving rainstorm down the middle of 3rd Avenue. And he must have had some idea of what I'm about to tell you was there. He's probably 30 feet in front of us. And suddenly he kind of disappeared. And he fallen into, as we learned later deliberately, this enormous pothole. He was sopping wet. He got out of the pothole. As I said, we're probably 30 or 40 feet away. Turned back to us, took a bow, and Lauren looked at me and said, now, aren't you really willing to give a guy crazy enough to do that a break and let him do it on our show? And I said, yes. As the president of the United States, Gerald Ford, right? Like, pretty much eventually. That's what he, that's, that's maybe what he was that's on. What, just, that, <laughs> yeah, that, that evolved. That, that, that's <laughs> And uh, that's what he's probably auditioning. And, 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 the, and the amazing thing was probably of every president that we had up to that point, Gerald Ford was legitimately the best athlete who had ever been president. That's right. That's true. <laughs> that's true. But the Chevy, that sort of evolved into kind of a joke. But we went to the White House, Lauren and I and Chevy and a couple of other people, to shoot show openings live from New York at Saturday night, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. I'm Gerald Ford and you're not. And, uh, <laughs> The ultimate irony is that as he finished his last thing that he had to record, which had been on a cue card, he started to walk away, forgetting he was hooked up to the camera. He pulled the camera over and went flying all over the floor with a film camera. But we never showed that piece of tape because he was such a guy we were not going to add to the falling down mythology dick eversall oh. here on the rich eisen show unbelievable uh in the few minutes i have left wow there's so many different ways to go when did you first meet I thought we had i thought we had the morning uh, <laughs> <I love it. laughs> when did eddie murphy cross your screen when did you first meet him uh, when did that ever happen for you well after lauren left the show yeah uh they gave it to somebody else and that person did not have much luck but she did she did hire Eddie. And when I got to Saturday Night Live about two months after he was hired, it took me about four seconds to realize he was about the most talented young person in comedy I had ever met. On top of it, he really could conceptualize all kinds of things. And with two writers who later wrote most of his movies, Blaustein and Sheffield, um, they began to write sketches uh, for me. And almost every one of them were Every one of them were memorable, including my favorite, which was the assassination 
of buckwheat. <laughs> there was Eddie's idea. It, the, the character was the hottest thing in America at the time. And he came in to pitch it to me. I said, hey, you realize not only are you maybe committing a big mistake here, but you're making my life really difficult. He said, come on, Dick. This is really a good idea. So, excuse me. I said yes. And the three of them, Blaustein, Sheffield, and Eddie, uh, sat down, wrote the assassination of Buckwheat. And about two hours later, they're back in my office. And they said, we got to do the follow-up. And I said, what's the follow-up? And they said, the assassination of John David Stutz. I said, who's John David Stutz? Well, he's the assassin. They, you know, <laughs> write down the three names. You know, it had to, couldn't be uh, right. a name. Jack Ruby or something like that, but it was uh, stuff. <laughs> we oh, my God. Only, the only addition to that story is that about a day and a half before it was done, it had been rehearsed, the censors came to see me and said, you can't do that. Too many people will think that we're really having an assassination. I looked at him and I said, are you guys out of your mind? This is Eddie Murphy, the hottest comic in America, and we're staging his character, but we <laughs> get out of here. And and they they kind of realized their folly and they they stopped doing their <laughs> Oh my gosh! Is it true, Dick, that the real Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers, asked you to please have Eddie cease and desist of Mr. Robinson's neighborhood? Is that true? Same yeah, same year. I'm sitting at my desk. My assistant comes in and says, "Fred Rogers is downstairs." I said, "Yeah, sure, sure, sure." <laughs> anyway, I finally said, "Bring him up." So he came up and he sat with me. And I think Bob Tischler, my co-producer at the time, and we uh, heard him out and he just said he thought it was uh, sacrilege and Mr. Rogers had this pure reputation and all that. And I said, Mr. Rogers, come on. This is a lovable comedy piece from somebody who loves you. No matter how I tried, I was getting nowhere. So I said, Mr. Rogers, come with me. And I walked him down the hallway with me into the writer's offices and where Eddie was. Oh, gosh. And I left him there alone. I figured particularly Eddie would romance the hell out of him. Anyway, uh, a little while later, Mr. Rogers stopped by my office to say goodbye and said he was sorry it hadn't worked out. I quickly went back down the hall. I said, what the hell happened? And he said, we tried everything, boss, but he just doesn't want it done. I said, well, we're doing it, but we just are not going to talk to Mr. Rogers anymore. And sure enough, we introduced the character that weekend. It was a sensation, and since it was such a wet kiss to Mr. Rogers, nobody in the media or anywhere else ever said a word about it, and I never heard from Fred again. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, has man, been shot. Dick, before I let you go, uh, Vin Scully, as we know, passed away recently. Uh, you getting him uh, on the microphone for some of the most incredible moments in the history of baseball. I mean, his passing was uh was just unleashed so many incredible memories you got a good vin story for me i do i i as soon as i got the job it just struck me having followed scully for so many years and knowing him a little bit i was sure i could convince him to come do the telecast with uh um with vin and uh what was up was he just needed to be really comfortable and he agreed to uh, to do the uh, the color, the Vince play by play. Reagan and uh, Reagan uh, had uh, already agreed to be party to it because I had taken uh, Vin to uh, when I went to meet with Scully the first time about all of this. Sure, and, and it was uh, again my favorite word under those circumstances: serendipity. Because everybody hit it off. Now on the day of that telecast. About two hours before air, uh, I got a phone call that Vin was going to be late. So I went downstairs to wait for him, and they brought him into a waiting room uh, under the stands behind the home plate. And he said, I, I won't do my Reagan impersonation because it's terrible, but he said, basically, Dick, I'm here only because I was able to persuade Mommy to let me come, talking about Nancy Reagan. He said I had a fall. Indeed, he had had a fall off of a horse the day before, but he did that telecast. And I don't think anybody out there saw anything off. He no. was terrific for the two innings. He was up there. And the only thing that was unbelievable, the all-star games in the previous years, immediate previous previous years had been a dud. 
And in that all-star game, I'll probably be off by one, but I think there were either four or five home runs hit in the first two or three innings. Well, it's not just that, Dick. It was the home run that Bo Jackson hit. I mean, and and, and, as you know, uh, obviously, throughout all the years, having a moment that the country would love to see and then it happens is, to use your word, serendipity, to the nth degree – I mean, you got Vin and Ronald Reagan and Bo Jackson homers off Rick Russell. I mean, that is yeah. unbelievable. Yeah, oh. it was. But then if you've read my book, you know that uh, good things just continued to happen for me. I've been I, – I'll never say I didn't work hard, but I was blessed by good friends and almost always the ability to get into the room. I always say to people – the thing that matters most is being there. And I managed to get into the room, whether it was uh, the office where the president Reagan was retired into in uh, Century City or to constantly be able to get into offices of sports leaders in Europe. And once I got in the room, I was pretty persuasive. And usually Jack Welsh, the head of GE that owned NBC at the time, had always entrusted me with tens of millions of dollars to buy the rights or to hire somebody. And I just kept kept getting people and kept building the reputation of NBC Sports to a level that no sports department has ever been in since the halcyon days of ABC Sports. Dick, you are the best, simply the best, from Saturday Night Live to Sunday Night, uh, a book by you, sir, and uh, Aaron Cohen, who you mentioned. And thanks for everything. Say hi to your entire family. Thanks for everything. I will. Much love to your bride. Right back at you. That is Dick Ebersole. This book, I mean, we just barely scratched the surface in that interview right here on The Rich Eisen Show.